My name is Frank Shamrock, world champion fighter, martial artist, warrior. My professional journey took me to the very top of the fighting world, but that success came at a high price. I've left a lot of damaged relationships in my wake. Now, I'm 40 years old. I've come to that place in my life where I'm ready to confront the past. The Warrior's Code says that's the only way to find peace. So to move forward on my journey, I'm traveling backwards and telling my story in a way it's never been told before. My goal was to be the greatest fighter in the world. When you look at the pantheon of the greatest mixed martial artists, you should begin with Frank Shamrock. He was the best fighter at his weight class. There was no one that was better. Five-time UFC champion. He was one of the first guys who really had the whole package. The greatest mixed martial artist of the 90s. He was the best fighter of the decade. Frank is a fighter. Never got tired. Aggressive. Technical. Different species. He was ahead of his time. In my opinion, he was the first complete fighter in MMA. He could wrestle, he could submit you, and he could strike with you. No one had really done that before in the way that Frank Shamrock had. Everybody else was a kickboxer, they were a wrestler, the jiu-jitsu guy. He was the guy who went out and did everything. I love Frank like a brother. I mean, he's one of my favorite people in the world. He was a good role model for a lot of these kids coming up from the street. Frank is a pioneer. Frank is somebody who has been laying down the runway for, for guys like me to take off. When you look at Frank Shamrock and know where he's come from and what he has had to overcome, martial arts saved his life. First person who taught me about martial arts was my foster brother, Ken Shamrock. But we haven't spoken in over 15 years. I felt he disrespected me, so I split from him and my father. Ken never forgave me for that. And now, in order to find peace, I know I need to talk to Ken, face to face. And knowing Ken, anything could happen. I'm not sure why Frank's doing this. There's a lot of stuff underneath the sea, a lot of bad things happening under there. Frank needs something. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's selfish. I don't know if it's for his career. Or maybe he needs closure. I don't know. But I, I sense something different. So we'll see what it is. Facing Ken, the pain of what happened between us won't be easy. But I've been dealing with pain since long before I knew Ken. Since I was a young boy. Named Frank Waters. I was born and raised in California. It was my mom and us, because my dad was gone. Reading was up and coming. It was kind of growing. All of us were very close as little kids. When I was seven, my mom met Joe, and we moved to Anderson for the first time. I thought maybe this guy could be a good dad. You know, he could at least help take care of us a little bit better. But at the same time, uh, he was an alcoholic. That was really scary to me because I'd never seen, you know, anything like that. Well, Joe had a myriad of punishments. The scariest one for me was, you know, getting locked in the closet. They would make him climb in the closet and shut the door, and then he would be in there for hours. As a little boy, it's, it just crushed me. I was already drinking in the park with the hobos by the time I was seven. But the real trouble started a few years later, the night I pulled a knife on my little sister, Susie. I'd stolen like a bottle of schnapps or something, and I was getting a girl drunk in the backyard, and my sister Susie was there, and she was like, I'm gonna tell on you, I'm gonna tell on you. And, and well, we got in this sort of verbal argument, and I grabbed the knife, and I told her, don't you ever tell on me, I'll, I'll kill you. She took it very seriously, went and told mom and dad, and the police came, and. 
Next thing I knew, I was sitting in a jail cell. I think I was just about to turn 12. We kind of realized that there's nothing we could do at that point, and he's going to stay in the system, so we kind of went on with our lives. Even juvenile hall wasn't as bad as my home, so I was like, this is awesome. I felt like I had some control of my life. I knew how to get out of really bad situations. You know, after that, I was like, I'm never going home, ever. I got out of juvenile detention when I was almost 13, and I was placed at the Shamrock Boys Home for Troubled Youths. For me, that was the start of a new life, a new family. When I first went there, I wanted to run away. I'd been to, I don't know how many homes, failed all, all, you know, every, every single one of them. Bob Shamrock lived like a king. You know, it was like he had his own little mansion. And then when he sat down, I kind of went to shine him and do my bit, and he just cut me off after about four words and said, you can stop right there and shut the hell up. I never had anyone call me on my shit or bust my nuts like that. I was in college, and my dad called me. You know, he said, you gotta meet this kid. You know, he's a good kid. He's got, got some problems, but man, I think if you can hook up with him and maybe, you know, mentor him a little bit, uh, you guys are kind of the same. So the first time I met Ken, Bob turns to us and just says, hey, if you can get Ken down, let me spank him 25 times. I'll take you all to dinner. I go, let's go grab him. I go to grab him. He turns right, he grabs my face. He smashes it right on the ground. <laughs> One move. <laughs> he looks at everybody and everybody just backs away. <laughs> That was the first time I met Ken. <laughs> he's, he's, you know, just like I was, just a punk kid. He was always laughing. His was, you know, partying and staying away from issues. Mine was anger. Bob had all these crazy kids that were all troublemakers, like real troublemakers. And, you know, he just didn't want problem. And it was as easy as saying, I got a problem with this guy. And we worked it out in a swimming pool. Put on two pairs of gloves and Guys would go in there and just slug it out until someone said, you know, I give up, and someone said, I'm sorry, and then we'd all move on. I fought in that pool quite a bit. <laughs> and usually after it was over, it was no big deal. Everybody was fine. There's always been a connection between Bob and Ken. Bob really gravitated towards Ken. This guy's my mentor. He's my dad. He gave me his life. Literally, he said, I... I'm going to adopt you because I'm going to take care of you and make sure that you live life right. I'm going to teach you. I mean, a lot of people don't get to choose their sons. Bob and them had something very special. I always wanted something like that with Bob. and That's why Bob, I think, was so powerful for me. I never had a dad. So he was the first guy who was like a real man. I started getting in trouble again right after my girlfriend, Christy, had our little son, Frankie. I was 16, still living in a group home, and suddenly I was a father. The whole thing was just a little too much for me. Christine and Frankie left me. So it was like the darkest day for me. Everything just, it's like everything fell apart in one day. So I'd gone off the deep end and really went on a crime spree that ended up with me robbing a Taco Bell one night. They sentenced me to six years in state prison. It was commonplace to go around stabbing people with pencils and fighting each other and, you know, battling over turf. I just knew right away, I, I just, I'm not going to survive here. He walked out of prison with long black hair, silky black hair. But I knew when he came out of there with that swagger and his attitude that I had to be the one because he had to respect me. He just threw me around like a rag doll. He put a, a real ass kicking on me. I very first went to jail. I fought the biggest dude there. And I fought because I had to. If I didn't fight, it would have been years of abuse. And you ain't gonna abuse me no more. They gave me the adult prison numbers. So I put that in my right arm. Every once in a while, I look down and I look at these and I go, oh yeah, that's why I keep my, you know, my nose straight and my head on right. My dad came to me one day and he goes, you know, Frank's gonna be out on parole. I said, well, what do you need me to do? And he goes, well, maybe you can, you know, be about getting Frank placed up here with you because he can't be with me because I'm running the group home. I took a breath for a minute and I went, 
you know he's in prison. I said, prison changes people. I made parole after three and a half years in prison. I was 21 years old and ready to start a new path in life. The day I got out of prison, Bob was there, you know, with his Cadillacs and everything. I never appreciated freedom until I got locked up. Ken was doing professional wrestling, and this fighting thing had just started. And uh, my dad was like, look, I see two careers for you. You're handsome, you've got a great body, you could be a great stripper. Or you could try this martial arts and wrestling thing that uh, your brother's doing. Well, I was just deathly afraid to, to go to the lion's den. I mean, I didn't know anything about fighting at all. Prison fights are quick. You hit a guy, you stab a guy, everybody runs, they shoot, you know, everybody hits the cover, that's it. And I thought it was tough. I've been in prison, I mean, I had a rough life, so I thought, you know, how hard could it be? There you go, come on, drive, 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 drive. Pull back out, pull back out, pull back out. Usually I did the initiations, and I beat the crap out of people. Nice. I literally beat the snot out of them. And I was gonna have the other guys do it, because I just didn't know if I could do it, because I knew how much my father cared for him. You walk out of prison with long black hair, silky black hair, gorgeous body. But I knew when he came out of there with that swagger and his attitude that I had to be the one because he had to respect me. And so I did it. And when he was done, he respected me. To make him quit. But I think the first one we did, we had 12 guys and two made it. The violence, a lot of people can't handle it. I'd never had my ass kicked ever in my life. Ken just threw me around like a rag doll. Tore my knees out, tore my arms out, he broke my nose. I mean, he put a, a real ass kicking on me. People that were in mines, Dan, they were all attitude, puffing, puffing big chest, all steroid guys. Those guys from the Karate Kid, uh, the Cobra Kai. Lions Den guys like the guy from the Cobra Kai. Exactly. To a T. <laughs> yeah, I could probably see why you would see that. We were hardcore. The culture of Lions Den is a very kill or be killed. That's it. But that's why we had all the world champions during that time. That's why Frank became a world champion. That's why Frank became the man he is today. Because he went through that brutalness. He knows he can go through it. He knows there's nothing worse he has to go through than what he went through that day. After six months of training, Ken decided it was time for my first fight. It was in Tokyo with the Japanese promotion Pancras. At the time, that's where the best no-holds-barred fighters in the world competed. Japan was the most surreal experience ever. The Japanese scene from the mid to late 90s it was like a high point that maybe we will never see again. One time I commentated on a fight that was 91,000 people. I was terrified that my first fight was going to be in Japan. Then I found out my opponent was going to be Boss Rudin. At the time, he was one of the most dangerous fighters in the world. The first time I fought Frank, I didn't know a lot about him because it was his first fight, you know? I heard he was a younger brother from Ken, so I figured he's gonna have a ground game. And I was all good until maybe, maybe about eight minutes in. Boss just, just kicked me right in the nose, broke the end of my nose off. And I remember my head just snap, and I remember going, oh my God, he's gonna knock me out, I gotta wrestle him. And then about a minute later, it was over. I walked over to my corner and I'm like, and Ken goes, I don't know, man. His very first professional fight, and he faced a killer from Holland, Boss Rutten, and he won. That was the beginning of it. I was in Japan, I made a friend, I had a fight, like all these things happened. It was, it was a really powerful moment. Frank Shamrock adapted a lot of the Japanese philosophy, I think, within himself, the allowing of the respect to be shown to the art. The day I got back from Japan, Bob told me he was gonna adopt me. I was 21 years old, and for the first time, I felt like I had a real father. 
I became Frank Shamrock. I think that's the first time he felt accepted. I think that's the first time he felt genuine love. My experience in Japan changed me. When I got back to the States, I knew that I couldn't be the person or the fighter I wanted to be if I stayed with Ken at the lion's den. Ken wasn't there anymore. He'd signed to do WWE. He put me in charge, but I was given no power or sort of authority to do anything. I was just supposed to do, you know, his way while he was gone. And I got lazy and, you know, eventually he came in and one night he just totally freaked out on me. To me, it was just, it was a violation of all the things he'd given me. I think when Ken went to the wrestling, he relied on Frank to be Ken like he was gone. And when Ken came back, that's not what happened. I think Ken will forgive him, but I don't think you can pretend it didn't happen. Ken told me that I don't have what it takes. I'm not going to be a world champion. I'm never going to be a world champion. And I should focus on what I'm good at, running his gyms his way. I just think there's a jealousy. I think he wants to be his own man. And I've always told him, if you ever feel like you don't want to be here, let me know. I, you, I'll give you my blessing. Just tell me. Don't run out in the middle of the night. And that's what he did. I called my dad the next day and he goes, son, you have to get right with Ken. And, and you know, until you do that, we can't have a relationship. I felt like Bob let me down at that time. I knew he loved Ken more, you know. It just was what it was. My biggest physical accomplishment was fighting Tito. I think there was maybe 9,000 people in the audience, and it sounded like there was like 50,000, because they were going crazy. And I just felt his fingers blow up on my head, grab my cut, and start pulling it open. And I was like, Tito, you nasty m what the hell's wrong with you? I'm on my way to meet my foster brother, Ken, face to face for the first time in 15 years. We became family after our father, Bob Shamrock, adopted us both. To this day, Ken resents me for leaving the gym and abandoning the family. But in my mind, I needed to go my own way because we were different people, different fighters. Frank Shamrock and Ken Shamrock are very, very different in a lot of ways. Ken is very, very confrontational. Frank was more of a scientist, whereas Ken was a brute. Frank is a person who could carry himself in and outside of the cage, respectively. Ken always thought he was too cool for school. People should be worshiping the ground he walks on, and I never really liked that. The first real defining fight in my career was when I fought Instant Man anyway in Japan in 1997. Whoever won that fight would move into the UFC and fight for the middleweight championship. Ensign, in a way, is a barbarian. He is known for saying, at least once in your life, train with the will to die. If you've ever seen the fight, it's like a knockdown drag out, and I rock and sock and robots. And there was a moment in the fight where he folded me over backwards and was sitting on my chest and punching my face in, and I thought, this is the moment where I die fighting. I didn't. I got out and I kicked his ass and knocked him out. And my life changed from that moment forward. After I beat Ensign in a way, I got the title shot for the UFC. Kevin Jackson, 1992 Olympic gold medalist, freestyle wrestling, just a stud athlete. Frank I said, he's got Kevin Jackson. I'm going, what? Kevin Jackson? He goes, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm going to armbar him. And I'm like, uh, okay, <laughs> but I'm not believing it. I'm thinking, wow, Frank, you're gonna armbar Kevin Jackson? Because, oh yeah, 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 I'm gonna do it. I didn't think it would be that fast, but when he rolled in and went up for that armbar, I just sat back and thought, damn, he set him up. And took out a phenomenal Olympic gold medalist based on being smart. When I won the UFC championship, it was like the biggest moment of my life, but I had won so quickly and it was almost effortless. My biggest physical accomplishment and my most memorable like physical act was fighting Tito. 
and it was the first time there was a concerted effort to really promote a fight and to make it bigger than life and you had two not only great fighters but you had two personalities that really were able to carry the promotion when the Tito fight came around, you know, Henry and I got together. I was like, Henry, I don't want to keep doing this. You know, this company's going down. I wanted to control my own destiny. I wanted to do my own thing. And I couldn't do that with the UFC. He just goes, oh yeah, just put in a retirement clause. <laughs> it was just one line that said, if I ever renounce my championship and publicly relinquish my title, the rest of this contract is null and void. I watched a lot of his fights in Tank Grace, uh, and fights in UFC, and he would demolish guys. It wasn't a factor of him just kick, out kickboxing somebody or out wrestling somebody or out doing jiu-jitsu with somebody. He would do it all. And I was like, wow, this guy's a full, true mixed martial artist. And I had a lot of respect for him. Going into the Tito fight, I'm already a believer in Frank and his strategies. He goes, I'm going to wear him out, and I'm going to finish him in the fourth or the fifth round. Some people have called it MMA's rope-a-dope, where Frank Shamrock takes damage and takes damage, but he hangs on as Tito gets more tired and more tired and more tired. I was going 100% nonstop, like a bull, nonstop every single round. And I remember in the beginning of the fourth round, I went, <sighs> I looked over at him, he was just bouncing, not even breathing. I was like, all right, what's going on here? He knew something I don't know. And I went for a low single, and he just punched me on top, right on the top of the back of the head right here, and hit me again. And that's when everything just went, I couldn't hear anything. There's Tito hanging off for dear life while Frank Shamrock is hammer fisting him in the most brutal, pent up aggression you've ever seen in your life. And Tito goes down, and the fight is stopped. It was a moment that proved that Frank Shamrock probably was the best fighter of his time. He made it about his advantages, and he was undersized in that fight, outgunned physically, and won that fight by TKO. And that was, I think, Frank Shamrock's defining fight. So after I beat Tito, I grabbed the belt, I grabbed the microphone, and I said, thanks a lot, but I'll see you guys later. I retire, you can have the belt back. The early contracts tied up the fighters' rights to exploit their name likeness and personality. Well, Frank was one of the original forces to uncap that and think about exploiting that for himself. And I think that was a big contribution that he made. I was the first, like, real free agent. I mean, I got out of the, you know, crazy contract that nobody can get out of. And for a minute, I was a hero because everybody wanted to do the same thing. The idea of Frank and Ken fighting, I thought it was a great idea because they really didn't like each other. It's a fight that should never happen. We're a family of fighters, so it's not that big of a deal. I love him so much, I'm gonna kick his ass. <laughs> My confrontation with Ken is coming up soon. Part of me hopes that we can put all this baggage behind us. But then again, we're shamrocks. Bob taught us to resolve our problems with our fists. Ken would beat Frank hands down, no questions asked. Ken is so darn strong that it's hard to beat that strength. Frank's come a long ways, but if they were both to fight each other, my money would be on Ken. As my dad had suggested, Ken and I almost fought about five years ago. At that time, I was confident it was the right fight for me and for the sport of MMA. There is no story bigger than two brothers fighting each other and the reasons why they're fighting each other. And we fight each other because we love each other. <laughs> I love him so much, I'm gonna kick his ass. <laughs> The idea of Frank and Ken fighting, I thought it was a great idea because they really didn't like each other. With them, it was real. If someone asked me, you need to give me a list of 100 terrible ideas, I would put Frank versus Ken Shamrock probably number one or number two. It's a fight that should never happen. We're a family of fighters. So it's not that big of a deal, really. I mean, they train in the gym together. Why not get paid to fight together? I think Ken wins that fight. I think Ken's rent space in his head as far as fighting goes. I think Ken has, you know, 
trained him and beat him down so much, I, I don't think he could get over that. If they were going to fight, I believe Frank could win. Ken doesn't have the striking skills or the conditioning to be Frank. Do it like Rocky and Apollo Creed, man. Go into a room, close the door, fight it out. Hug afterwards. Nobody needs to know who won and lose. After I beat Tito, retirement suited me just fine. I got some acting gigs, wrote a book, and got involved in several business opportunities inside of MMA. One of them was the rebranding of Strike Force. But eventually, I felt the pull of the cage stirring in my blood. I helped Scott Coker launch Strike Force with the first sanctioned MMA event in the state of California. To make a mark, we renewed the oldest rivalry in the sport, Shamrock versus Gracie. First, I knocked out Caesar in 21 seconds. Then I lost to Henzo on a technicality. It didn't matter though. San Jose was quickly becoming my town and the HP Pavilion, my house. When Frank came to fight here, he represented San Jose, and as time went on and the sport got a little bit more popular, the, the people embraced him. He was the hometown hero. The Baroni fight, that's the fight where I really became aware of my brand. When I came out of that jersey, man, I just remember lifting my arms. Like, as the arms went up, the, the noise went up. It was just amazing. And then I knew I was on to something. The whole time, I'm picking on him, I'm talking to him. And he's just getting madder and madder and madder. After one really good right hand, I step back and I go, this is the moment he's gonna go out. He looks at him, I'll never forget. You're going to sleep. And then minutes later, that is exactly what happened. And it's like, wow, this is poetry. I was now the Strike Force middleweight champion. A third title to go along with my WEC and UFC belts. But my reign as champ lasted less than a year. Kung Lee broke my arm with some vicious kicks, and I couldn't answer the bell for the fourth round. As soon as he kicked me, I could feel it. I was like, holy, he just broke my arm. And the bones are totally crooked, and everything is jacked. I've never been hurt like that. It was the worst shape that I had ever seen him in. He was in a lot of pain. It was kind of scary. I was worried that I might never be able to fight again. Luckily, that fear was replaced with joy when Amy and I had our little daughter, Nicolette. Soon after that, I was able to start training. And a year after my loss to Kung, I was ready to get back in the cage again. When I found out that Frank Shamrock had agreed to fight Nick Diaz, I was not surprised at all. Because when you look at the ingredients involving Nick Diaz, the bad boy from Stockton, and Frank Shamrock, the elder statesman, the iconic photo of Frank Shamrock going to shake his hand, and Nick Diaz flipping him the, the bird, and, and all of the back and forth trash talking. Wow, you've got quite the cocktail. I thought Frank was going to win from the moment he walked out of his dressing room. And I had seen Diaz have a couple fights, and I thought he was pretty good, but I didn't think he was going to handle Frank. Frank couldn't get going. Diaz had his number from the opening bell. It was hard to watch. It's a little more painful and, and unsettling when it's like a close friend. You know, I could feel minute by minute that he was better than me. And there's nothing I can do about it. I wanted the ref to stop it. It wasn't like I wanted sitting there trying to do damage. After the fight, when it was stopped, Nick Diaz went to Frank Shamrock to, to pick him up. And he said to Frank Shamrock at the time, get up, you're the legend. And I stood up, man. I always respect him for that. I was, he didn't have to do that for me. I knew when I was standing up after the fight that the torch had been passed. And I knew Nick was the, the new me, the younger me, the, you know, the next generation. I am Frank Shamrock, in a way. Part of me is Frank Shamrock, and that's what I brought. That's what I brought to the fight. Sitting in the locker room after the fight, you know, people were coming in, paying their respects. I could, you can just tell the train had stopped. Thanks again, Mick. I love you, bro. I love you. Take care of yourself. Warrior, from hell you love are. Love you, bro. It was upsetting seeing this warrior sitting there all banged up. I think Frank's darkest moment was after fighting Nick Diaz. 
and realizing that he wasn't going to be fighting anymore. He was scared inside, like, what am I going to do next? Not having fighting in my life was really difficult for me. I felt lost. Then I got even more bad news. I got a call from, from Tanya, and she said that, uh, you know, uh, Bob's real bad. He's in the hospital. He's had another heart attack. You should probably come see him. Bob wanted to be able to say his piece to Frank and know that whatever conflict they had was over. Frank had a choice in how he wanted to react or handle it. He left him laying there, not allowing him to go in peace. Frank didn't come to the funeral. I thought it's like count quite a bit. I just can't understand how somebody can just blow somebody off. You know, what did he do to him to cause Frank to not go to his funeral? I mean, come on, man. It was the fear, I think, of being a distraction, struggling with respect and how much meaning there was in making an appearance at a funeral as opposed to, you know, loving and respecting the person that died. And I didn't know, I didn't know what to do. I really regret not calling him, because I still think about him all the time. Every time I see my name, he was my daddy. Ken isn't the only brother of mine that I'm looking to reconnect with. I haven't seen my blood brother Perry for almost seven years. He has a psychological disorder, and he's been living homeless in Redding, California for some time now. I'm worried about him, and I've decided I need to find him. I had three siblings growing up, Robin, Susie, and my older brother, Perry. I haven't seen Perry for almost eight years. Before going to Vegas to sit down and meet my foster brother, Ken, I need to find my blood brother, Perry. Last I heard, he was homeless somewhere in Redding, California. Over a year ago, he wrote me and told me he needed money. I'm ashamed to say I never responded. He didn't look good last time I saw him, so I'm worried about him. Man. I can't live like this, man. for you, man. Uh. What are you doing, man? We're traveling around looking at, um, looking at my life, you know? From fighting to everything that happened in prison and all the shit. I heard from mom maybe a month ago. She went out, fell off the grid for about six months. And then uh, Robin and uh, her husband split up just last week. So she moved to Santa Barbara. So the family's kind of broken up. I haven't been in contact with anybody since I, I quit using um, my laptop. Yeah. It's been about maybe two years. I'm glad I found you. I'm surprised you, should, you found me. It's rough down here. You don't get to do all the fun stuff you want to do. Yeah. Perry, I'm giving you my home number. Okay. And if you need something, just let us know. Perry, I hate to say it, but I gotta go, dude. I hate to leave you here, too. Oh, shit. Here, be safe out here and get out of here if you can. Um, okay? Now let me know if I can help you. Okay. All right? All right. Thank you, thank you. I love you. Oh, man, it's been... 
or eight years since I've seen him. I didn't know he was living like that. I just need some help. I gotta help him. I gotta help him get out of there. Seeing how he's living now made me really sad and also guilty, knowing I haven't helped as much as I could have. Now I have to face a whole different set of emotions. It's time for me to head to Vegas to meet Ken. I just can't understand how somebody can just blow somebody off. What did my dad do to him to cause Frank to not go to his funeral. If Frank and Ken met today, it could go either really good or really bad. I wouldn't mind just putting all the cards on the table. That would be therapeutic for everyone involved. I've had a lot of complicated relationships in my life but none more than Ken. He was the older brother that I idolized. He also beat the hell out of me, humiliated me on many occasions. It's been more than 15 years since we parted ways, and he still hates me for leaving the family. I'm really not sure if we're ready to put all this behind us. There's a lot of stuff underneath the sea, a lot of bad things happening under there. My father passed away. That was really the only thing that had bound us together anyways. My dad gave him everything. And he spit on him. People asked us, well, what if he gets smart with Ken? Is he gonna kick his ass? And my first reaction was, you know, yeah. I mean, I'll come up out of the chair and I will literally beat the hell out of him. start by saying um, thanks for being my teacher and for giving me the martial arts. I look up to you. You know, I think your way was the way. I'm a little confused. The issue that you had with me was that you always felt like I was the one over the top of you, like you needed to get out and do your own thing. Ken, you didn't believe I could be a super, you know, fighter because That's I That's not wasn't. true. I know you want me to. Oh, oh you me my to. gosh. I didn't take anybody that I didn't think could do it. You passed that trial. The only people that pass that trial are people that are badasses. This is your own insecurity, man. The journey I was on, bro, I so damaged. When Dad passed, I, I couldn't even deal with that moment. I didn't even know what to do. And the hardest thing in the world was not to go. I did that out of respect. That's what I thought I was supposed to do. Yeah, I don't buy that. I'm, I, I, I'm not saying this to be disrespectful to you. I'm not saying this to hurt you. But you were a coward. You were a coward. Everything that I knew of you, the way you stood up for yourself, the hard training that you went through to get to where you needed to be, all that went out the window when you couldn't come and face the man that helped you, the guy that saved your life, the guy that gave you the opportunity to train with me, and you didn't allow him to get any peace at all. You let him die with no closure. Yeah, I know. You know, I left because, you know, he told me once I learned that how to fight, and once I, you know, became a pro, you know, that would be your equal. 
And, uh, you know, when you just, <laughs> just threw me down like that in front of the students and the fighters, and it's like, dude, it's not how you treat somebody. We're or fighters, for somebody. God's sakes. I'm not a fighter. I'm a human being. Frank, you're a fighter. I uh, know. I'm a, I'm a human being. I beat the hell out of everybody. I, I yelled at everybody. Look, I just... Bob was the first man ever to show me love. And when he told me my love for you is conditional. And it's conditional on you making up with Ken and having a life with Ken. And I'm like, Ken, are you kidding me? He's crazier than I am. He's more up than I am. And I just realized, I was like, I can't do it. You know who he asked for before he died? Do you know who he asked for? Probably me, because I wasn't there. I believe in my dad. And I believe he knew a lot when it came to psychology, working with kids. And he, he told me, he said that he thinks the only way you and me are ever going to get closure and ever going to move forward is if we had a fight. We could go in there and we could get it done. And all the anger and all the stuff that was pent up, we could get out to heal whatever it is that was going on there. And Do we have to beat each other up to get closure now? It's, it's, come on, dude. We did it in training and didn't get paid. No, but I'm, I, I don't want to get hurt anymore. <laughs> this has n have no bearing on anything that goes forward from here. If you do, great. If you don't. And it'll never be discussed or, or talked about ever um, outside of this if, you, if we don't do it. It's just, just never happened. Either way, dude, I'm, I'm, I'm good. Me too. Thank you, Ken. I guess the only thing I have to say now is, man, hey, I, I just, I ask for your forgiveness, man, for anything that I may have done to hurt you. I know I was stubborn, I know I was hard, but I didn't do any of that out of malice or hurtfulness. Thank you, Ken. Yeah. I ask for your forgiveness as well. Done. I didn't mean to hurt your feelings Done. or disrespect you in any way. No, I appreciate that. Seriously. <laughs> All right, brother. Love you, man. we could have got it done any other way than like this face to face no way of skirting and getting around it i think a lot of what happened to him propelled him to greatness that's why frank has turned out the way he has he has channeled all of that negativity and then just in a positive fashion built himself up and it's a constant struggle do not kid yourself Frank Shamrock not just beat a lot of guys and won a lot of belts. He's established a new threshold in terms of thinking about what MMA fighting is and what an MMA fighter should be. I think in the future, Frank will go with his heart, his gut. I think he will get involved in martial arts again. It's something that's in him. Just never underestimate him. <laughs> When I decided to take this journey, I really didn't know what to expect. I knew I needed to find Perry, and I knew it was time to face Ken, and the rest of my past as well. But I had no idea how hard it would be. All my life following the Warrior's Code has taken me to places I was afraid to go. But always, when I got there, I was glad I made the journey. That's how I feel now at peace with myself, as a shamrock, as a fighter, and as a man.